Hi everyone and welcome to my Book Week Scotland session for South Lanarkshire Libraries. Um, thanks so much for tuning in to hear me talking about my new books. Obviously this year we're having to do it online, it would have been much more fun if we could have got out and about and, and met face to face and had a nice chat in the, the local library or the local bookstore but I suppose it is what it is and at least it's given me an excuse to get dressed today and put on some makeup. There may or may not be pyjama bottoms and slippers on the bottom half, that's all I'm saying about that. But anyway, hope everybody's keeping safe and well and let's crack on and talk about the books. So I'm the author of three books now and they all feature a private investigator called Jessica Shaw and she's pretty much um, introduced in the first book really quite well if you want to know more about her and her backstory, um, the first book is called Thin Air. And basically Jessica Shaw specialises in finding missing persons. And at the start of this book, she is in a, a diner in Los Angeles. She grew up in, I should probably say, she grew up in New York. And then her dad died a couple of years ago and since then she's been on the road and moved about so she's got no home as such, she just sort of stays in motels and, and things like that so she's in this diner just outside Los Angeles trying to find her next case to work on and she receives an anonymous email from a mysterious John Doe and the email is entitled your next case question mark and it's about a uh, the case of a, a three-year-old girl who vanished from Los Angeles 25 years ago and has never been found and Jessica basically looks at the photograph and recognises herself as the, the toddler in the picture. So that kind of kicks things off for that book. Basically she goes from finding missing persons to discovering that she herself has actually been a missing person for 25 years, which of course brings up a whole load of questions, what happened, what happened to her biological mother who she actually finds out that she never really knew anything about and the biggest thing I suppose is it brings up questions about the man that she believed was her dad for all those years. So that's the first book in the series. The second one is slightly different actually because it's not a missing persons case so this one's called Bad Memory and in this one, Jessica's actually been hired by the sister of a woman who's on death row. And the woman confessed to two murders on the night of 4th of July, 30 years earlier. And it's a week before her execution and the sister basically wants Jessica to find out if the woman is actually guilty of the crimes that she confessed to because as the title might give you a hint. Her memory of what happened that night isn't the best. Um, so Bad Memory was actually long-listed for the McIlvany Prize this year so that's something I was really quite super proud about because it's really quite amazing to be in the, the company of people like Val McDermott and James Oswald and Doug Johnson and Ambrose Parry. So that's Bad Memory and the new one is Dark Highway. So that actually comes out very soon. It's out this month, November 19th. And this one is, again, it's it's back to the missing persons situation. So Jessica is hired by the parents of an LA based artist who's disappeared two months ago. And her camper van was found abandoned on the isolated 29 Palms Highway. But what starts out as one missing person case quickly becomes three missing person cases. Um, three women who have all vanished over the last two years and they're all connected by the fact that their last known whereabouts were the 29 Palms Highway. So it's really just, is there anything else that connects these women and how is what's happening in the modern day connected to something that happened many years ago? So what I'm actually going to do now is give you a wee sneak peek of the 
the prologue for Dark Caribou. Um, so hopefully you enjoy it. There were four of them in the car. Five, if you counted the dead woman in the trunk. Nick sat in the back seat, way too close to her for his liking. He pinched his nose and breathed in heavily through his mouth. He was convinced he could smell her, even though he knew that was unlikely. He didn't think she'd even be cold yet. But what the hell did he know about this stuff? There hadn't been much blood at least, something to be thankful for. The car bounced beneath him as it hit a rough spot on the blacktop, and the nausea that had been churning away in his gut leapt right up his throat. Nick tasted vomit in his mouth and swallowed hard. He sucked in a big long full of air. Next to him, Junior didn't look too good either. Dusty turned around and glared at Nick from the front passenger seat. The crusty dried blood around his nostrils appeared black in the gloom. His eyes had a wild look about them. Coke and liquor and something else. Something bad. Nick could see that now. Would you quit with the panting? Dusty snapped. You sound like a mangy old dog begging for a treat. Get a grip of yourself. Nick turned away and looked out of the window. The moon was as perfectly round and white as a dinner plate. It cast an eerie glow over the flat, desert landscape. The mountains far off in the distance, nothing more than shadowy purple outlines. They passed a bar that had long been shut up for the night and a motel with a single light burning. Along the roadside, a dozen or so mismatched mailboxes were jammed into the dirt like a row of metal flowers. The homes they belonged to were set back off the highway and shrouded in darkness. Nick envied the inhabitants of those houses, no doubt fast asleep in their beds. He wondered if he'd ever sleep soundly again. He thought about the woman. Christ, he couldn't even remember her name. That would be the booze and the shock, no doubt. But he figured he'd be hearing it plenty soon enough. How long before she'd be missed? How long before they'd start looking for her? He knew she had family. She'd said as much when she begged Dusty not to hurt her. Her pleas had been ignored. As for Nick and Junior and Z, they stood back and let it happen, frozen by their fear of Dusty and what he was doing and what he wanted them to do and what he did to her in the end. They were every bit as bad, every bit as guilty. Afterward, they wrapped her body in trash bags like she was a piece of garbage and carried her out to Z's car like they were told to by Dusty. Of course, they didn't use his wheel wheels to get rid of the body. There was no chance of Dusty messing up his brand new Miata for a dead girl. In any case, the old cutlass that Z had inherited from his daddy had way more space in back and no way was Z going to argue once the decision had been made. Cade was the only one who'd had the guts to stand up to Dusty. He was the reason she'd been there tonight, the one who'd persuaded her it'd be a good idea to come along. Nick could tell straight away that Cade was real sweet on the woman, the goofy grin on his face when he'd first introduced her, the way his eyes had followed her all evening. Her smile suggested she was sweet on Cade too. Then Dusty had shown up, and everything had gone bad. Later, when Cade had refused to get in the car, Dusty had given him a look that said he'd be next to find himself stuffed in the trunk, but the guilt and grief and anger written all over Cade's face had clearly been stronger than any hold Dusty ever had over him. He'd walked off into the night, shoulders hunched, hands plunged deep into his jean pockets, didn't look back. Nick wished he'd had the guts to stand up to Dusty too, they drove on. The terrain was sparser now, only the occasional lonely property or rusty trailer to break up the empty desert chaparral. They passed a road sign warning, Nick services 100 miles. The four young men travelled in silence. No conversation, no music on the radio. The only sound was the gentle thrum of the old automobile's engine. The car smelled of windscreen washer and old camel cigarettes and fresh body odour. The sweat on Nick's back stuck to the voile upholstery through his t-shirt. Pull over here, Dusty said after a while. Z eased the car onto the shoulder, cut the engine and headlights. Only that big fat moon 
illuminated the otherwise dark highway now. Dusty opened the glove compartment and removed two flashlights, handed one to Z and then got out of the car. The others followed him. Dusty turned on the flashlight and popped the lid of the trunk. Nick didn't want to look, already knew what he'd see inside, but he couldn't help himself. A shovel had been tossed carelessly on top of the dead woman. Its blade glinted under the flashlight's pale beam. Nick heard one of the others retch, followed by the wet sound as vomit hit blacktop. Nick's eyes met Dusty's cold, hard stare. What? Nick asked. His voice was raw, barely a whisper. Dusty nodded toward the open trunk. Grab the shovel, he said, then start digging. Well, that's the opening to Dark Highway, which I'm hoping has maybe intrigued you enough that you might want to, to check that one out. Um, I should probably have mentioned right at the outset, despite my accent and the fact that I'm quite clearly not American, <laughs> the, the books are all US set thrillers. Um, so Dark Highway is the third book in the series, but it is worth pointing out you don't have to read them in order. They're all standalone mysteries that are resolved at the end of that book. So if you like the sound of that and want to check it out straight away and jump straight in there without reading another two, that, that would work okay. So I thought um, maybe it would be a good idea to answer some questions that I, I usually get asked quite a lot in the absence of being with a with an audience in a library to, to get any questions from the audience. So I have my, this might be luminal coffee mug here with some questions that I'm going to pull out at random and we'll see where we go with those, what ones pop out. So, <laughs> why set the books in America? This is something that, as you can imagine, I get asked quite a lot. Um, I suppose that the, the first reason is I really enjoy reading books set in America. Um, American authors such as Michael Connolly, Karen Slaughter, Lee Child, who is obviously from the UK but sets his books in America as well. But I suppose that the, the biggest reason, is, as you might have picked up from the, the plots of some of these books, is basically the storyline. So for that first book where Jessica Shaw finds out that she's been a missing person for 25 years, um, it just seemed more plausible for that to happen in America, that she could grow up in New York and never be aware of this case involving the, the toddler from Los Angeles. It just seemed a bit less plausible if that was in Scotland, that you maybe grew up in Edinburgh and there was this famous missing child case in Glasgow that you had never come across. So that was kind of the main reason and also had a, a kind of vague idea for the, the second book, Bad Memory, which obviously is a death row book, which pretty much has to, to happen in America as well. So, so hopefully that answers that question. Next one out, biggest influences. So I suppose most of the time that would be other authors that, that you like to read. Um, but I suppose going back to when I was a youngster, the, the first sort of big influence would be Jessica Fletcher and Murder, She Wrote, which was one of my favourite programmes and is still one of my favourite programmes. It's the best way to spend a nice chill, chilled out Saturday afternoon just binging loads of episodes of Murder, She Wrote. And actually that was part of the inspiration behind the, the name for Jessica Shaw for my own character which was a wee tribute to Jessica Fletcher. In terms of um, authors, probably the, the two that I read kind of really kind of binged a lot of their series early on would have been Mark Billingham and Carm Slaughter, who I mentioned earlier on. And in terms of the actual writing now, the ones that would be the big influences would be Lee Child. Obviously he's created an iconic character in Jack Reacher. But the thing I probably like the most about his books is the way he, he writes about these small town settings in America with all these people with secrets and bad things going on and then he shows up in, in town and 
and kind of sorts everybody out. So that's that was a big influence. Michael Connolly with his Harry Bosch series set in Los Angeles. So that kind of makes you want to write about Los Angeles as well. And probably the other one would be Gillian Flynn, who's probably best known for writing Gone Girl. Um, but her other, other books are fantastic as well. Um, Sharp Objects and Dark Places. And the thing about her, apart from being just an absolutely fantastic writer, is the, the way she creates these really interesting female characters. So hopefully I've kind of done the same with Jessica Shaw in, in these books. Back to the coffee mug. Where do you get your ideas from? Now, unfortunately, I'm not like a lot of other authors with a big file full of hundreds of ideas. So I kind of maybe get one or two good ideas a, a year if I'm, if I'm lucky. And I suppose mostly they come from real life. So it could be something that I see on the news or an article that I've read online. Um, that's not to say that any of the books are actually based on one real life case, but it could be maybe just a small detail in a real life case or a general theme or just something that, that sparks an idea and then I'll kind of take that and run with it and it'll end up being something completely different to the, the story that kind of provided the inspiration in the first place. So. I suppose an example would be for um, Thin Air. I've always been kind of intrigued about these cases of like missing children, these kids that are really young when they disappear, big high profile cases. And then as the years go on and if they're, they've still not been found and then they would be a teenager by now or they might even be in their 20s, be, be an adult. And I was just always intrigued by that idea do they know who they really are? Or are they completely unaware? Do they have any idea that hundreds, thousands of people have been searching for them, for them for, for, for years, decades even? And what happens if one day they find out who they really are, that, that, that people have been looking for them all that time? And how does that then affect their life when they realise that their, their whole life isn't isn't what they, they expected it to be. So that, that was kind of the basis for Thin Air, but the, the kind of added twist is obviously the fact that the main character tends to find missing people for a living. So I think we've got time for just one more quick question, which is, how did you get into writing? Now, I suppose my answer is probably the same as loads of other writers, which is that I started off being a reader. I was never out of the libraries when I was a, a youngster. I was obsessed with the Sweet Valley High books, which, if you don't know, it's a, a sort of teen series set in Southern California, which, again, might be another reason why I ended up writing books also set in Southern California. And basically I was obsessed with these books and I would go to the local library with a list of the ones that I still hadn't read in that series and if the library didn't have it in stock but another library in Glasgow had it, my poor dad would be dragged round all the libraries because I would be too impatient to wait for my own library to order it in for me. So it would be a case of, oh, okay, Mary Hill or Govan's got it in stock, let's go and we'll head there tonight and get the book before the library closes. So. So really I started off as a reader before the idea of writing came into it and then it was really just, I was probably about 11 years old when I decided I was going to be a journalist because that seemed a more realistic way to get paid to write stuff. Although I did think at that point I was going to work for Just 17 or Smash Hits and spend all my time interviewing um, major celebrities and stuff so maybe not that realistic. But I kind of, um, so I did go on and study journalism for a couple of years at college and I came out and started just trying to get small features in newspapers and, and things like that and then kind of accidentally ended up being a football journalist for um, I think about 18 years in all 
and I say accidentally because I wanted to write features for magazines or like the women's section in the, the, the Daily Record newspaper, things like that. So I ended up writing about football, which was good fun as you can imagine. You get to do a lot of travelling and see a lot of places and it's, it's quite a fun way um, to, to make a living. But I think the whole time it was bubbling away in the background that it was books that I really wanted to write. I'd started going to crime festivals at Harrogate and Bloody Scotland and you, you get to meet authors, really big name established authors, but also other ones that are just starting out. And as time went on, they were going on and getting book deals and having books published. And, and I just never really had the confidence to do it myself. But eventually they started saying, look, this book that you keep talking about, you have to write it. You have to stop talking about writing a book and sit down and write it. So eventually, one day, that's what I did. And thankfully, the outcome was thin air. So, so basically, I think we're almost out of time now, but hopefully that's given you a wee bit of information about my life in crime and the Jessica Shaw books. And hopefully you're intrigued enough that you, you might want to pick one of them up and, and give it a go. And hopefully um, at some point really soon we can get out and about and meet in a bookstore or a library in person and that would be really good. But in the meantime, stay safe everybody and thanks for watching.